You should have up on your screen the PowerPoint announcing the title of today's Lunch and Learn, and we'll go ahead and get going. Again, I'm Lisa Jordan. I'm with the Maryland Coalition Against Sexual Assault. The Maryland Coalition Against Sexual Assault is the coalition of all of the rape crisis centers across the state of Maryland and people like you who are interested in ending sexual violence. That is my email there. You are all welcome to reach out. Please know that many of the ideas that we have for legislation come from the field. So if you reach out with an idea about a public policy concern, know that your voices will be heard and we are listening. Today, we're going to be talking about laws that passed in Annapolis. So these are state laws, not federal laws. I'm happy to report that Maryland state government is in considerably better shape than the federal government and that they are passing laws and actually generally functional. I will uh, not comment on what's going on at the federal level, although please know that we do have national advocacy going on and your voices are represented there. I'm going to start with funding. We just have a couple of funding issues to talk about. We'll move on to policy after that. Funding for victim services, as you all know, is important to sustain services, to increase equity, and also to address the workforce changes that the entire country is facing, including the victim services field. In particular, there is a huge issue with VOCA funding. So that's Federal Victim of Crime Act funding. This is rape crisis center funding, but also domestic violence shelters, human trafficking work, child advocacy centers, child abuse services, families of murder victims, victim witness assistance in states, uh, prosecutors offices, all sorts of victim services are supported with VOCA. There was a huge gap in VOCA funding and the state has risen to the occasion. And what they have said is that Maryland is going to provide at least $60 million worth of funding for victim services. So the way it will work is we'll get the money from the federal government and then the state will add what's needed to reach up to $60 million. This was an amazing effort by Chair Guy Gazzoni and Chair Ben Barnes who sponsored the bill know that it does not guarantee that you and your program will get exactly the same amount of funding every year. It's just an overall pool of money that will be available. Maryland is seen as a model nationally for passing this bill, so huge success. The second funding bill that I wanted to mention is the prompt payment bill. For those of you who administer your programs, you probably know that the state of Maryland does not always pay its bills on time. For those of us who are in nonprofit organizations, this is a huge problem, right? And so there is now going to be a mandate that the agencies pay uh, grantees promptly within 37 days, and if they don't, that they will pay interest. Moving on to policy bills. First, I'm happy to report that marriage is no longer a defense to sex crimes here in 2023. So in particular, Delegate Charlotte Crutchfield spent five sessions trying to make sure that we repealed this archaic law, began in the Senate with Senator Susan Lee, who's now Secretary of State, and then Senator Ariana Kelly took over the reins and got the bill passed this year. Um, so this means that marriage is no longer de facto a bar to prosecution for certain sex crimes. There were several bills that passed regarding abortion access. Abortion access is hugely important for rape survivors. About 5% of reproductive age women who are raped become pregnant as a result of that rape. And almost 3 million women in the US have experienced rape-related pregnancy. So this is an issue that is of concern to many, many people in the world, but to people who are working with sexual assault survivors in particular. There were a bunch of bills, I wanna mention two in particular. One is there will be a constitutional amendment on the ballot that will enshrine reproductive liberty in the Maryland constitution. So know that that effort is coming next year. 
And then the other issue is especially important for those of you working with survivors, because it addresses the question of liability, both civil liabil liability and criminal liability. There was a concern that we would help someone uh, obtain abortion access and then be vulnerable to a lawsuit or criminal charges or licensure issues uh, if you're a, a licensed professional. And so a bill passed to protect us in that service provision to survivors or anyone who is seeking an abortion. After decades of efforts, a bill passed to expand the statute of limitations and allow survivors of child sexual abuse to file civil lawsuits. So there is no statute of limitation anymore on these cases. It can go back even for cases where the statute of limitation had previously expired. There are some questions about the constitutionality of this bill. They put language in the bill, however, to make sure that that issue will be resolved promptly. So survivors know where they stand with these lawsuits and also know that the issue of bankruptcy might dilute the effectiveness of the bill to some extent. In particular, the Baltimore uh, Archdiocese has filed for bankruptcy and that may deprive some survivors of the ability to seek justice. Do you want to say thank you, especially to Chair C.T. Wilson. He is a survivor of child sexual abuse himself, and he really put his own story and his own life out there in an effort to persuade the General Assembly to pass this bill and understand the impact of child sex abuse on survivors. Part two of repealing archaic laws, in addition to making it so marriage is no longer a defense to sex crimes, they also repealed a bill that criminalized consensual, unnatural, and perverted sex acts. And that statute has historically been used against the GBLTQ plus community that passed as well. So this will no longer be a crime. A bill passed regarding safe harbor for child trafficking victims. Um, you may know that when a child, someone who's under 18, is a survivor of sex trafficking, is being trafficked, they often commit kind of low-level crimes. They might possess drugs. They might engage in joyriding. They might... Um, uh, they, the, any sort of low level crime, shoplifting, I'm sorry, is what comes to mind. And so what this bill does is it gives those child victims immunity from prosecution. It recognizes that these children are victims themselves. They are not criminals. Law enforcement will have to advise the regional human trafficking navigator that they suspect sex trafficking, advise the Department of Social Services, return the child to a parent or guardian if that's safe or someone else if a parent or guardian is not safe and the child can't be placed in detention. Again, recognizing this child is a victim, not a criminal. There has to be a hearing within 15 days and a judge will decide by a preponderance of evidence um, whether or not the alleged crime was a direct result of trafficking. If it was, you know, they, they stole uh, feminine hygiene products, for instance, shoplifting as a result of the trafficking. Frequently, traffickers deprive victims of those sorts of products. That charge will be dismissed. That allows the survivor to have services instead of prosecution. A bill passed about people in authority. So already against the law in Maryland for a person in authority to have sex with the children that they have authority over if they fell into a designated list. Coaches, teachers, principals, guardian, uh, uh, guidance counselors, those sorts of folks. But there still was a small gap for people not on that list. This closes the gap. It says adults who are over 21 and six years older than the minor and is directing or supervising that minor in a program cannot have sex with that, with that minor. This will include both volunteers and interns. So it's an important expansion of the law, closing that remaining gap in the person of authority bill law. You know from your work with sexual assault survivors that few sexual assault survivors seek help through the criminal justice system. When they do, state's attorney's offices can't always prosecute. Sometimes they choose not to. Sometimes the evidence isn't there. Unfortunately, we were seeing too many cases where survivors just never heard back after reporting the crime. 
This law requires that at the request of the victim, the prosecutor has to explain why the case is not being prosecuted. Images of child sex abuse are frequently referred to as child pornography. And when child pornography was originally criminalized, it was back in the days of magazines and paper. Um, most child sex abuse images are now transferred over the internet and our law failed to include streaming. So we could prosecute when someone downloaded an image, but not when it was being streamed, including streaming of live sex shows, often uh, international cases involve live sex shows of kids um, or just people who are viewing child pornography via streaming. This now is closed so we can prosecute those cases as well. A fairly technical bill on pre and post trial release clarifies that if someone has an order saying do not contact a victim pre or post trial, that order applies even when the defendant is in jail. So what was happening is there would be a hearing, the judge would say do not contact this victim, the defendant would be in jail awaiting the release and the judges said, hey, this law doesn't apply. It only applies after release. So that loophole has been closed as well. Two bills passed about sexual assault evidence kits, often called rape kits. One is about tracking. And so this creates a tracking system for rape kits that's going to be accessible by survivors. So if you have a rape kit performed on you, you'll be able to go to the tracking system and see where is that kit in the system. So this really will be an empowering thing, we hope, for survivors. Really excited to be able to report that, that the purchase of the tracking system has been approved, and I'm hopeful this will be up and running, I'm hoping next year in 2024. The second bill that passed regards retention of rape kits. They increase the mandatory retention of rape kits to 75 years. It also requires that if you have a self-collected kit, that that kit won't simply be discarded. It has to be delivered to law enforcement. That's not subject to testing requirements. It just says, give that kit over to law enforcement, let the prosecutor figure out how to proceed. We're also going to work with the Attorney General's Consumer Protection Division more on this issue of self-administered rape kits. There are a lot of concerns about these kits. I'm gonna talk more about that when I talk about what to expect next year, um, but just know that we are continuing to make progress in this area. A bill was passed about the Board of Nursing and Operational Reforms. And you may be thinking to yourself, what is this doing as part of MCASA's presentation? The issue is this, the Board of Nursing controls whether or not someone can be a forensic nurse examiner. And the operational concerns at the Board of Nursing were so daunting that we have forensic nurse examiners who are qualified, they're ready to help survivors, but they simply couldn't get the paperwork done because of the operational issues at the Board of Nursing. We are one of many types of uh, patient advocates who really need this fixed. And this reform effort, I hope, will address all of our concerns. Two bills passed about sexual harassment. One provides the attorney general with the authority to enforce civil rights, including through class actions and injunctions. And this is a very broad bill. It affects all sorts of civil rights, um, but it does help survivors of sexual harassment. Um, and I'm very pleased that Attorney General Brown is very interested in making sure that people recognize that sexual harassment is a violation of civil rights. The second bill that passed is a kind of a smaller bill in that it's a very technical bill. State employees used to have a shorter amount of time to file a complaint about sexual harassment or any form of harassment than everyone else. This expands the time that state employees have to file that harassment complaint. So they're treated the same way as private citizens. A bill passed affecting survivors regarding schools. It's the Hear Our Voices Act sponsored by Delegate Jazz Lewis. And this is to increase information about Title IX. It requires that schools notify 
K through 12 students and parents and faculty and staff about the Title IX process. And in particular, that they also talk about the supports that are available for students who are victims of sexual misconduct at school. All too often, we were seeing cases where students and parents didn't even realize that they could ask for things like moving a class schedule or delaying a test or some other accommodation to support that victim survivor. Major reform in the family law arena. Uh, they have reformed the grounds for divorce in Maryland. And so instead of proceeding on fault grounds, such as cruelty of treatment or excessively vicious conduct, we have no fault grounds now. This is really important for survivors of domestic violence because it provides a quicker and a less contentious way to end a marriage. Other states that have taken this approach have found that it really has improved safety um, for survivors. And so it's, it's an important improvement in our family law process. A couple of technical things to note, the parties can still be living together and considered separated. And that's important for people who don't always have enough money to establish two households. Know that injunctive relief is still available. Injunctive relief is something that we routinely seek when we've got a case involving intimate partner violence or child sex abuse or any, any sort of abuse. You want a long-term civil order saying, stay away from the plaintiff or the, the survivor in this case. That is still avail available. Additionally, fault is still a factor for alimony and for monetary awards. So fault hasn't disappeared, it's just disappeared as a grounds for divorce. Victims of abuse and utility accounts, this is another fabulous law that passed. This requires that utility companies permit a victim of abuse, including sexual assault or child sexual abuse to terminate a utility contract. This was uh, led by our sister coalition, the Maryland Network Against Domestic Violence, and they did a fabulous job enacting this important practical uh, form of relief for survivors. So people used to be kind of stuck under, uh, under utility contracts and that has now changed. So those were some of the bills that passed last year shift gears a little bit, think about what's going on next year. The next radical idea is the radical notion of consent. The Maryland Coalition Against Sexual Assault respectfully proposes to all of you that we are not walking billboards saying, have sex with me unless I say no. That it really should work the other way around, that people should not be able to have sex with you without your consent. So a bill will be introduced to address this idea. It will eliminate the requirement under the current law that a victim prove resistance. So right now, the law doesn't just require proof of the sexual act and no consent. It also requires proof of either force or threat of force, effectively saying that we are all saying yes until we say no. It will change that, that's the most important piece. It will also create a statutory definition of consent that includes clear and voluntary agreement, that includes that consent or lack of consent can be by words or conduct. So this is not affirmative consent, something that has passed in other, other uh, states. It will require consideration of the totality of the circumstances. It also has several things that will not be considered consent. So consent is not a current or previous dating or social or sexual relationship. Just because you said yes once doesn't mean you're saying yes forever. Consent is not how you dress. And importantly, that consent is not submission as a result of fear or threat or coercion and anticipating uh, a question, a question we've already received, documentation is not required. 
Another bill to look for for next year regards self-collected evidence, and we talked a little bit about this before. This is important, and I especially wanted to be sure that this group has this on their radar. There is a commercial entity that is misrepresenting how its products can be used and its usefulness in court. So we want to be sure that, that you understand what the ins and outs are and that you know that the Attorney General's Sexual Assault Evidence Kit Committee is making policy recommendations about self-collected kits in December. So, you know, a month away. From MCASA's point of view, we really believe that collection and analysis are two separate policy issues. Certainly, many of us have been in the position of saying to a survivor, save your clothing, save your bed sheets, you know, save, save other evidence. We don't want to interfere with that. And we don't want to create some sort of bar if a survivor wanted to do self-collection of evidence herself or his, himself. Analysis, however, is something that we really believe must be done by a government entity in order to have that analysis admissible in court. So those are two separate issues. We are very concerned that survivors have every option that, uh, that makes sense, that they know about, that they have information about, and that we also not mislead people about what can and cannot be admitted into, into court. Um, as part of that, again, the Attorney General's Consumer Protection Division is working with the Sexual Assault Evidence Kit Committee and looking at are there misrepresentations being made to consumers or to people working with consumers that need to be addressed. For more information about uh, new laws, about future laws, about uh, different things that we're working on, you can sign up at MCASA's um, website under the public policy tab, sign up for e-alerts, and I also invite you all to our legislative reception. We have this every year on the second Thursday of the session. So this year, that's January 18th at 630 at Red Red Line. It's really important that our legislators meet all of you and know the people who are working with survivors across the state of Maryland. I'm going to end by asking you to do three things. During session, you get to pick what they are. You can do three phone calls. You can make three emails. You can do a text, an email, and a phone call. But if every single person on this call, there are 103 participants. If all of you participated in the legislative process by reaching out to your legislators and say, sexual violence is an important issue to me. I care about how survivors are treated. I wanna make sure there is access to justice and I wanna make sure there is access to services. It, this is a huge, huge uh, voice for survivors. So please take the time to do three things during the legislative session, that's January to April. If you'd like to do something prior to January to April, know that this Saturday is the Maryland Legislative Agenda for Women uh, Conference. You're always welcome to participate in that, it's important. A conference for a wide range of women's issues. Um, and also know that prior to session, it's always a good time to reach out to your legislators, to your representatives, and ask them questions um, and let them know that you care about the issue of sexual violence. So with that, I do want to just say thank you for everything that you do. Um, you know, the people attending this are really the folks who are on the ground working with survivors every day and know that AMCASA is your coalition, that we are here to support you and that we appreciate everything that you're doing.